All right, so two orders of business today. First order of business is to finish the Hungarian algorithm. This is for the minimum cost bipartite perfect matching problem. So I'll remind you where we left off Tuesday and then finish that up. And then the second half of the lecture, I'm going to give you a survey of some problems which are more general than the ones we've studied so far, maximum flow uh, and bipartite matching, which also have efficient algorithms along the lines that we've been discussing. Okay, so a few other problems. I just want you to know they exist. They're solved using techniques similar to what you've learned uh, so far in this class. All right, so let me page everything back in for you from Tuesday. So what do we do? So we're talking about the min cost perfect matching problem. And so again, the first thing we did is structural, not algorithmic. We wanted to know how do we know when we're done? How do we know if a perfect matching really is minimum cost? So that motivated an optimality condition. And so the optimality condition says that a given perfect matching is minimum cost if and only if there's no negative cycle. Let me remind you what a negative cycle is. Okay, so it's a bipartite graph. So every cycle in the graph is going to be even. So first of all, a negative cycle has to be alternating. Okay, so every other edge is in the matching. Every other edge is out of the matching. That's, of course, as many edges as you could have from the matching in the cycle. And then what does it mean to be negative? It means that the edges in the cycle that are in the matching have higher costs than the edges in the cycle which are out of the matching. So here's an example, this four cycle. The pink edges are the matched edges. The edges in have cost seven, the edges out have cost five. So that would be a negative uh, cycle. It's easy to see that the only way it could be minimum cost is if there's no negative cycle. If you give me a negative cycle, I can just toggle the edges in that side of that cycle. I get a new perfect matching and its cost is strictly less than the one we started with. So it's certainly necessary for optimality that there's no negative cycles, but it's also sufficient. That's the hard direction, which is that if there's no negative cycles, then in fact you really are minimum cost. So we proved that last time. So then we started thinking about, okay, how do we actually come up with an algorithm to compute a min cost matching. Okay, we know what we want the termination condition to be. We know the termination condition should be no negative cycles, but how do we get there efficiently? And following the same strategy that works so well for maximum flow, especially in the push relabel lecture, we're going to have some invariants, which our algorithm maintains at all times, so that those invariants imply the optimality conditions. Okay, so this isn't an algorithm, but it's guiding us closer and closer to an algorithm. Okay, it reduces the algorithm design problem to just maintain the invariants and compute a perfect matching subject to them. So what were the invariants that we were going to maintain? So first of all, each vertex has a price, so it's called P of V. This could be positive or negative. And then with respect to prices, every edge has a corresponding reduced cost. CP of the edge, which is just the original cost minus the prices of its endpoints. Okay, so that's the reduced cost. Both of our invariants are about these reduced costs. The first one is that just every edge, whether it's in the matching or not, should have non-negative reduced costs. Okay, so we don't allow negative reduced costs. Secondly, for the edges that are in the matching, we insist on something stronger that the reduced cost is actually zero, the minimum possible. Okay, and so those edges are called tight if you have reduced cost zero. Yeah. What's the motivation for these invariants? Well, as we proved last time, if you satisfy these invariants, then there's no negative cycle. Okay. So what we need to do is compute a perfect matching so that the invariants hold, and then we're going to be done. Okay. And that's sort of the algorithmic problem we're going to focus on. I also told you Tuesday what sort of the main loop of the algorithm looks like, and what are the two different types of updates which are going to happen in, the, in each, each iteration of the main loop. So obviously we're going to keep looping it as long as our matching is not perfect. Okay, we're going to keep trying to increase the number of edges in our matching one at a time until we get to a perfect matching. So one good case is if we find a good path. I'll tell you what that means in a second. But a good path allows you to increase the size of your matching by one without screwing up the invariance. What do you do? You just toggle the edges in the good path. Okay, more on that in a second. And then if we fail to find a good path, what I'm going to prove to you today is that we'll find what I was calling on Tuesday a good set. And if you have a good set, then you have this particular update of the prices, which makes progress in a certain sense. So it should be clear that this can only happen n times. Right? Remember, n is the number of vertices on both sides of this bipartite graph. A perfect matching has n edges. Each good path augmentation increases the number of edges. That happens only n times. It's not obvious, but what I'm going to show you is that this second step, this price update, can only happen n times at most until we find a good path. 
So this happens at most n times. In between each two times this happens, this happens at most n times. So that'll be an n squared iteration bound. As you'll see, it's not hard to implement each iteration in linear time. Okay? So at a high level, that's what we're going to be doing. Any questions about that review? Okay. So let me remind you what a good path is. So it's sort of by definition what allows us to increase our matching size without screwing up the invariance. So, and this is sort of the picture you should have in mind. If the pink edge is in the matching, then the blue edge could be a good path. So first of all, both of the two endpoints of the path should be currently unmatched. Okay? Secondly, they should be on different sides of the graph. Okay? So the, the starting point is on the left side, the ending point is on the right side, both are unmatched. So if you think about it, that means the length of this path has to be odd, right? Because it keeps bouncing back and forth between the left and the right-hand side. If it ends up on the right-hand side, it has an odd number of hops. The second requirement is that it's alternating. So again, the edges alternate being out of or in the matching capital M. Okay? And because, remember, both the endpoints are unmatched, definitely that first hop and the last hop are gonna, not going to be in the matching. So if you have a nine-hop path, you're going to have five edges out of the matching and, the four, and then four edges in the matching. Finally, all of the edges of the path should be tight, should have zero reduced costs. What's the motivation there? Well, we want all of the edges on this path to be eligible for membership in the matching. And remember, we have this constraint that anybody in the matching better be a tight edge. Okay? So if you ever find a good path, then you do that first part of the while loop. So you take the XOR, the symmetric difference of your current matching and this path. So if you had like this nine hop path, you'd be kicking out four edges, the ones that were already in the matching and in the path. And then you'd be putting back in five edges, the ones in the path which are not in the matching. That would give you a matching with size strictly bigger, strictly more edges. And you don't screw up the invariance. Why not? Well, you haven't changed the prices, so you haven't changed the reduced costs. So invariant number one's fine. You've put some new edges in the matching, so that could screw up invariant number two, but by definition, all the edges in the path are tight. So that invariant's fine as well. Okay. So what I want to talk about, and this is the first kind of new stuff compared to Tuesday, is how do we find a good path? Or assert, you know, how do we do a search for one? Okay, so any questions before I talk about that? So I'm going to show you a linear time algorithm that strives to find a good path. And if it fails, it's going to find what we were calling a good set on Tuesday. Okay. Clear? All right. And don't be scared. This is really just going to be like BFS, breath first search with a tiny twist. Okay. In fact, you know, w before I actually describe the algorithm formally, let's just kind of follow our nose. And if we just go through an example, I think it'll be obvious what the algorithm has to be. So imagine the following. So imagine we're at some point in our algorithm. So we have current prices, P, and we have a current matching, M. So what I'm showing here is the tight edges only. Okay, only the edges with zero reduced cost. The graph may have many more edges. It might have lots of edges that have strictly positive reduced cost. This is the graph only of the tight edges. Okay? So remember the graph with all of its edges, we're assuming has a perfect matching, but that certainly doesn't imply that you have a perfect matching just consisting of tight edges. So like this one clearly does not have a perfect matching because node four is isolated. But this is totally something that might come up in the middle of the algorithm. Okay, a subgraph of tight edges that looks like this. And maybe this is our current matching, say, of size of three edges, matching six of the eight vertices, okay? So using this as a starting point, we now want to say, okay, how would we search for a good path, okay? So first, I mean, so just to know where we're going, is there a good path in this example? There isn't. And sort of one way you could see that is, you know, if there were a good path, then you could augment this to a matching with four edges, which would be a perfect matching. But obviously there's no perfect matching just of the tight edges, because vertex four doesn't even have any edges uh, incident to it. Okay? So just, you know, 
we're going to be doing a search for a good path, clearly this search is going to fail. So we're interested in, you know, what happens when this algorithm fails. Okay. So, what would be, let's just follow our nose. Like, what would be kind of like the, probably the first thing you might try about finding a good path? Well, you know the two endpoints should be unmatched, okay? So just pick, say, the first unmatched node from capital V. Okay, so let's say we start here, a uh, different color. All right, so three is unmatched. And we're going to do BFS with a twist from node three, okay? The reason we need a twist is because of this condition two. We want to make sure that we find a path which is alternating. Okay, so that'll motivate the twist. But first we just start with BFS. Okay, so we just say, okay, and, and again, we're only searching on the tight edges, remember, because we want a path which is all tight edges. So we only search on the tight edges. We start at three, we say, who are three's neighbors? Let's go explore them. Okay? So level one of the BFS tree, so that's going to be level zero. Level one is just the neighbors of the starting point. Okay? Now, what if either two or seven was unmatched? What could we say? We'd be done, right? We'd have a good path. We'd have a one hop good path, right? So its endpoints are free. The edge is not in the matching. And it's a tight edge because we're only searching on tight edges, okay? So if two or seven is unmatched, we can just stop and return the good path. And remember, we're happy when we find a good path, okay? Now, in this example, that's not true, okay? Neither two nor seven is unmatched. They're both matched. So here's where the twist goes, and again this is to ensure the alternating property. So in every even level, what we do is we only put the nodes there that were matched to the nodes in the previous level, the vertices in the previous level. So what we're going to do, so because 2 is matched to 1, we're going to put a 1 here, and because 7 is matched to 8, we're going to put 8 here. So conspicuous in its absence is node 6, okay? So if I was doing normal BFS, 6 would also be a child of 2, okay? Why am I not doing that? Because then I would have a path in the tree which was not alternating, where both of the edges in a row were out of the matching, and we want alternation, okay? So we do a BFS level, then we just look at who they're matched to. If anybody, we put those at the next level, and then we switch back to BFS again, okay? So we just interleave those two different steps. All right, so here, well, we get stuck at 8, right? 8's only neighbor is 7, and we've already seen 7. Uh, 1, we're not stuck. So 1 has two neighbors, 2 and 5. We've already seen 2, but we haven't seen 5 yet. So we put 5 on level 3 of the tree. Now, let me ask you, suppose that 5 was unmatched. That would also be great. We'd also be done, actually, if you think about it. Right, so it wasn't just like if a level one node was unmatched, we're good. If this level three node is unmatched, we're also good. Why? Because the path in the search tree from that node back to the root is a good path. Okay? So by construction, the two endpoints uh, are both unmatched. By construction of the tree, every path in the tree alternates edges out of it in, in the matching. Uh, and again, the tree only searches tight edges. Okay. So if 5 was unmatched, we'd be done. We'd have a good path, we'd stop. Now 5 is not unmatched, it's matched, namely to 6. And now at this point, we're stuck. Okay? 6's neighbors are 2 and 5, and we've already seen both of them. Okay, so this is where BFS would just sort of stop. Okay? So we failed. We didn't find a good path. Okay? So what's the algorithm more formally? So you just grow a tree. Level zero is, let's say, the first unmatched vertex of the left-hand side. And then we're going to do something different, as you've seen, on the even levels and the odd levels. So for the odd levels, so the way we create you know, an odd level from the previous even level is just by BFS. So level i for i odd, just do BFS, again, amongst the tight edges only, from level i minus 1, okay? 
And again, as usual, if you've already seen some vertex in a previous level, you don't include it again, okay? like in normal breadth for search. And then in an even level, what you put there are the vertices that are matched to vertices in level i minus 1. Okay? And then you stop if you ever find uh, unmatched vertex. Okay? So the algorithm makes sense? I feel like you could code that up in Python easily enough. All right, so before I erase this, a couple announcements. So exercise set number three I just posted right before class. Problem set number one, as you know, is due Tuesday at midnight. And you might want to review the course homepage for the late day policy. So there are late days, but they're pretty limited. So have a look at the official course policy. All right, so is everyone with me so far? So we have this now subroutine that may or may not find a good path. We actually trace through an example where it doesn't. We agree if it ever ends, if it finds an unmatched vertex, we have a good path, we're done. Okay, no problem. So what I have to do now is I have to show if this algorithm gets stuck, stuck the subroutine gets stuck, we can extract from it some other way of making progress. Okay? Everyone clear up to there? Okay. So let's think about, you know, in general, so here we have a particular search tree where this algorithm got stuck. Let's think about what a stuck search tree looks like in general. So here's an important point. And this is where we actually use the assumption that it's a bipartite graph. Remember, I promised that has to be important somewhere. So it comes up in a subtle point right here. So here's the claim. I claim that if you think about any matched edge, okay, so any, any pink edge, either it's not in your search tree at all, meaning you didn't find either one of the endpoints, or both of the endpoints are found and in your search tree. And moreover, the two endpoints of that matched edge have to appear on consecutive levels with the first level being an odd level. And you can see that up here, right? The matched edges go from level one to two and from level three to four. And the claim is that's gonna be true generally. Okay, any matched edge with one endpoint in the tree actually has both endpoints in the tree. The first vertex at an odd level and then the other vertex at the next uh, level, which is gonna be even. So why is this true? Well, so assume you have a matched edge and you hit one of its endpoints, okay? So consider the first level where you find one of the endpoints of this matched edge. So the big question here is why can't you encounter both endpoints of a matched edge at exactly the same time in the same level? So for example, what, would be what if two and seven were actually matched up in that upper right corner? Then this would be false. Right, then it wouldn't be true that the endpoints are on consecutive levels. It'd be on the same level. So how can we be sure that there isn't some matched edge between 2 and 7? Good. So that would give us a triangle, right? If there was an edge between 2 and 7, we'd have a triangle. That's an odd cycle. And bipartite graphs can't have odd cycles. Okay? And that's true in general. Okay, so if you ever encountered both endpoints, of a matched edge in the same level, then you'd trace back the two paths back to the root, and that would trace out an odd cycle. That doesn't exist, so that can't happen. Okay? So that's where we use the bipartite assumption. All right? When you find one endpoint of an edge for the first time, you, don't, you have not seen the other endpoint yet. Okay? So I guess the other thing you, I need to argue is why, can't, why couldn't it be consecutive levels where i is even? 
But if you think about it, that doesn't make any sense because every vertex at an even level bigger than zero is already matched to somebody on the previous level. Okay? You can only be matched to one person, so if you're already matched to someone in the previous odd level, you can't be matched to someone on the next odd level. Okay? So that's why the first endpoint is always going to be seen at an odd level. Okay? Even levels are always matched to vertices of the previous odd level. Okay? So questions about that claim? So again, let me just to emphasize, we sort of use the G as bipartite. So you can't reach VW in the same level. Okay. All right. So suppose we get stuck. Oh, so I guess just to review, so this also kind of hammer, hammers home the point that if we ever find an unmatched vertex, then we're home free. Okay? So notice that if we ever find an unmatched vertex, where's it going to be? It's going to be at an odd level or it's going to be at an even level? Like, where's the first place we could find a, an unmatched vertex? Which level? Level one, right? So we could find one on level one. And more generally, in any odd level, we could find one. Why can't we find an unmatched vertex at an even level other than level zero? Because by definition, all vertices at an even level are matched to a vertex at the previous level. Okay? So unmatched vertices are only at the odd levels, which means the path from an unmatched vertex back to V is going to have odd length, which is what we needed. Of course, it's going to be only tight edges. And again, by construction, every path in the tree is alternating. Okay. So what we need to understand is what's, what's up when the algorithm gets stuck. So let S be the vertices at odd levels. Okay. The claim is that n of s, so let me remind you what n of s is. I defined this last time. So n of s, this is just the neighbor set of s. So you just take the union of all the neighborhoods of vertices in s. But remember, we're doing it only for the subgraph of tight edges. Okay? So n, is at, n of s is the vertices on the right, reachable by a tight edge from a vertex in s. So the claim is the neighbors of S from tight edges are exactly the vertices on odd levels. Okay. Um, oh, sorry, yeah, I said this twice. Actually, what I mean is this should be even. Thank you. So as far as this picture is concerned, that's S, OK? And the claim is that the vertices uh, that are reachable from S by a tight edge are exactly 2, 7, and 5, OK? So why is that true? Well, so why is, this, why is this equality true? Well, consider about the two different inclusions. So certainly any vertex in an odd level is an N of S, right? Because it was, how did it get in the tree at an odd level? It has to be adjacent to something at an even level via tight edge. So what we're concerned about is that there's some neighbor, okay, so some vertex of N of S that somehow we didn't find when we explored in our search tree. So do you see why that can't happen? Do you see why it is that every single vertex adjacent to somebody in S by a tight edge has to show up in the tree? I hear some proposals. Good. That's all. It's just BFS, breadth first search. OK? So breadth, you know, any kind of graph search like this, Right, it finds everything sort of findable. 
And remember, at the even levels of this search procedure, right, which is where it's starting from a ver the vertices at S, it explores everything. It adds all the neighbors. Okay, so what, so what, is, uh, what is an odd level? It's all the neighbors of the previous even level that you haven't seen yet. Okay? So that's why there's no way there's going to be some vertex in N of S that you don't see in the tree. Okay? <coughs> All right. So now I have everything lined up so that I can explain why you can only get stuck with a good set. So I have to remind you what a good set is. So this is just the same definition from last time. So it's a good set. It's a subset of the left-hand side. So that first of all, it has at least one unmatched vertex. We know that's true. The root of the tree is unmatched. And secondly, it should be that all of the neighbors of S are already matched to a vertex in S. Okay? So like in this picture, it's asserting that 6, 1, and 8 should be matched to vertices in the odd levels of the tree, which of course they are. And that's going to be true in general, because why did a vertex wind up at an even level? By definition, because it's matched to a vertex at the previous level. Okay? So all of the odd, or so to put it differently, the ver, ver, every vertex at the odd level has to be matched to somebody at the next level. Okay? Otherwise, that would have been an unmatched vertex and we would have stopped. Okay? So any questions about that? Everyone agree that these two properties hold when you get stuck in the search algorithm? Okay. All right, so this was, uh, this was the definition I gave you. And I explained on Tuesday how you do an update when you find a good set. Let me just remind you. So for all V on the left-hand side, you increase the price by some amount delta. For everybody on the right-hand side, you decrease by the same amount. Okay. So we have S, we have N of S. Every vertex of N of S is already matched to somebody in S. There might be other unmatched tight vertices. So how do we pick delta? We take delta as large as possible, subject to our invariance. Okay? What could go wrong with our invariance? Well, we have invariant number two. Variant number two says, so we're changing the prices. This is a little bit dangerous, right? We're not changing the matching, but we're changing the prices. So we're changing reduced costs. So if we had any edge in the matching, which went from non-tight to tight, from tight to non-tight, that would violate invariant number two. So that better not happen. But remember our property about these matched edges and trees up in the upper left, either both endpoints of a matched edge are in the tree or neither one is. So either both of the prices stay exactly the same or one of the endpoints goes up by delta and the other endpoint goes down by delta, which means that the sum of their prices stays the same, which means the reduced cost stays the same. Okay? So that's why invariant number two doesn't get broken. Every matched edge either has neither price affected or they're affected in opposite directions by the same amount. So the only invariant we might break is invariant one, that all of the reduced costs are non-negative. So how could it be that a reduced cost becomes negative? Well, for that we want to think about an edge which is not tight that looks like this. Okay, an edge that has strictly positive reduced cost. And again, remember, everything we've been talking about has been about tight edges. The non-tight edges have been invisible until this very moment. So now let's sort of think about putting the non-tight edges back in the graph. And notice that for an edge with one endpoint in S and the other endpoint outside of N of S, 
Well, now one of its prices is going to get raised by delta. The other endpoint's price is going to be unchanged. So its reduced cost will drop by delta. Its so reduced cost is going down as we take delta larger. So if we take delta larger enough, it might go negative, and that would break our first invariant. So we just raise delta until a new edge becomes tight. A new edge has reduced cost zero. Okay. So we choose delta so that this now becomes tight. Okay. So now we see a sense. So is that clear? So that's how delta gets chosen. And delta, we chose it so big so that it zeroes out somebody's reduced cost. Okay. And we argued last time why there has to be some edge that gets zeroed out because G contains a perfect matching. So now what I owe you is an explanation of how was this progress, right? We haven't changed the matching at all. Right? So that's the most obvious measure of progress, which we're not satisfying. But here's the thing. Right? So remember, what is S and N of S? Those are all of the vertices we encountered in some search tree, starting from V. Next iteration, with our new subset of tight edges, we're going to restart this search again from V. So what can you say about the search tree we're going to encounter next iteration versus the one that we got stuck on this iteration? going to make more progress, right? So all of the edges in the tree, they're still tight. Okay, they're still there. The matching is the same. All the reduced costs are still zero for all the edges in the tree. Remember, the two endpoints get um, increased and decreased to cancel each other out. But now, the search is not going to get stuck where it did before, because here's another vertex, which we're going to find on an even level. And so that, from it, we're going to be able to do BFS and hit one more neighbor. Okay? So the upshot is, because we have this new tight edge going to some vertex not in N of S, our next search tree will have at least one more vertex than our previous one. Well, a search tree can't possibly have more than all of the vertices, so we can't do this price update more than N times without, in the meantime, doing a matching augmentation, without finding a good path. Okay? So that's the, basically the entire analysis of the algorithm now. What have we argued? So surely you only find a good path at most n times, because the matching can only have size n. We just argued how you can only have n price updates between good paths, the reason being that the search tree grows by one with each price update. And I'm not going to go through it in detail, but hopefully it's sort of intuitively clear that each iteration is going to run in linear time, if you implement it correctly. Because again, it's just really BFS with a twist. Okay? So the final runtime is O of M. This is the running time per iteration times N squared. Okay? And this is actually exactly the running time in the analysis that was uh, discussed by Munkries back in the 50s that I told you about on Tuesday. Okay? So that's the Hungarian algorithm. Any questions about that? So again, maybe just to recap, wh what actually is the algorithm? Uh, so I, have, I sort of gave it to you piecemeal, so maybe it was hard to keep it all in your head at the same time. So you maintain a matching, initially empty. You maintain prices, initially zero. You have these invariants, you have this while loop. Each while loop you have as a subroutine this search tree procedure, okay, where you interleave BFS searches with just adding the matched edges. If you find a good path, you augment the matching, go to the next iteration of the while loop. If you don't, I showed you how to find a good set, taking the even nodes of the tree and the odd nodes of the tree. The dual update is add delta to the left, subtract delta from the right, go as much as you can. And, um, and uh, yeah, and so that can only go n times until you have uh, your next augmentation. Okay? So that's the, whole, that's the whole algorithm. Just this one while loop with then the search procedure each time, and then either the XOR of the matching or this dual update. Yep? In practice, do we actually hit that bound? It seems like those are very loose impulse steps. Do we actually hit that? That's a good question. So the question is, is the analysis tight? And in the worst case, I'm pretty sure this is tight. So if you allowed me to come up with the arbitrarily devious graph uh, and edge costs, I think I, could, I think I could force it to be this way. 
Um, now, on the problem set number two, you are going to explore faster implementations, um, which are, you know, are faster both theoretically, but it's also, you know, like we're using no data structures at all to prove this bound, right? So independent of, you know, what happens in practice, I mean, even just, it's, it's obvious you'd like to do, you know, some smarter data structure work to speed up this algorithm. So there's a couple ways to do it. There's a couple pretty simple ways to get this down to nm log n. Okay. And so one way to do this is just to use heaps in a smart way. A different way to do this is, is sort of a slightly different algorithm where you basically just run Dijkstra's algorithm n times and in a clever way. So problem set two will step you through uh, both of those two things. Okay. So that's the Hungarian algorithm. Any questions? All right, so the rest of the lecture is going to be somewhat less technical, a little more high level. Which board do I want? Let's use this board. Okay, so we basically talked about three problems so far in 261. Four problems if you count max flow and min cut as different problems, but let me count them as the same problem. So we started with max flow, min st cut. We observed that actually max cardinality bipartite matching reduces to max flow. So the arrows here are going to mean become harder. Okay, so any problem further up reduces to a problem uh, that it points to. Then we ought, then what we just discussed was minimum cost by apartheid matching. So that obviously includes max cardinality as a special case. So this is what we've covered so far. So some things you might be wondering are, is there a nice common generalization of these two leafs, so of max flow and of min cost by part type matching? And there is. So I want to tell you a little bit about max min cost flow, excuse me. So again, that's a common generalization of max flow and min cost by part type matching. Another thing you might be wondering about is what's up with matching in non-bipartite graphs? Very reasonable problem. So non-bipartite matching obviously includes bipartite as a special case. And then of course, if you really want to be greedy, you could also add costs. Okay, so you could talk about min cost, non-bipartite matching which obviously includes the cardinality case as a special case and includes the non-bipartite, sorry, the bipartite special case, okay? So I want to give you just a, a brief sort of overview of these three pink problems for the rest of the lecture, okay? Any questions about the web? All right. So, you know, just as far as terminology, so there's this field called combinatorial optimization. And that's, you know, that's what we've been studying these last few weeks. So that just means finding efficient algorithms which optimize over a collection of discrete structures. And uh, so these six problems, augmented by two problems you already know a lot about from CS161, minimum spanning tree and shortest paths, those eight problems, I think most people would agree, that's you know, the list of fundamental problems in combinatorial optimization. That's a full list. There are other problems in the field, but I think as far as the most central ones, after this lecture, you will have seen them all, okay? So for these last, I'm not gonna be able to really tell you anything 
you know, in detail about these other three problems. So what are the takeaways? So the first takeaway is just that these problems exist. Okay, these more general problems. There are applications which are captured by these more general problems that aren't captured by the three I've told you about already. Now, these applications aren't quite as frequent as the three problems I've told you about. That's sort of why, why I focused on those problems. But still, they're useful to know. Min cost flow, for example, it's very useful to know that the problem exists and that there are fast algorithms for it. Um, right, and so as far as, so how fast, how fast can you solve these problems? Again, you know, it's not like breadth for search. It's not going to be near linear time, but you can get running times for all of these problems, which are ballpark the kinds of running times we've been seeing so far. So there are algorithms with running time roughly n times m for all of these other three problems as well. So again, you know, millions of nodes might be a problem, but you can still counter uh, pretty big graphs. So they're efficient algorithms, and then the third takeaway, which you're just gonna have to take it on faith, is that the, these algorithms and the way that they're analyzed follow exactly the same recipes that you've been learning in 261 so far, okay? So you're very well positioned to study these problems in detail in a different course or on your own if you ever need them. Okay, so again, one talks about optimality conditions, one sort of talks about augmentation subject to invariance, and so on. Okay, it's the same ideas, just kind of a little bit, a little bit to the next level. Okay. All right. So min cost flow. There's a few different equivalent ways to formulate this, but let me just give you one specific formulation. So just like in max flow, you have a directed graph, you have a source, you have a sink. The way I'm going to specify it, there's a target value, flow value D, okay? So the feasible solutions to this problem are going to be the flows that push D units from S to T subject to the usual conservation and capacity constraints. And so for all edges in E, have a capacity which is non-negative and the cost, CE, which can be either positive or negative, it doesn't matter. Okay. And what's the goal? The goal is to minimize the cost of the flow. What's the cost of the flow? Well, you look over all the edges, you look at how much flow uses an edge, and you look at the per unit cost of sending flow on that edge. Okay. So among all flows that push D units from S to T, you want the flow that makes this number as small as possible. Or if there's no flow of value D, then you should correctly return that fact, okay? So notice we already know how to compute, to figure out whether or not there exists a feasible solution. We can just run max flow in this graph and see if the max flow value is at least D or not, okay? So that tells us if it's feasible or not. The goal here is to actually optimize over the feasible, feasible solutions, okay? So just, uh, I'm not gonna have time to talk about detailed applications of min cost flow. I might put one on a, on a problem set. But just to you know, help you appreciate this problem, let me notice, let's notice some special cases, okay? This actually, this captures simultaneously three different pretty interesting problems, which is pretty cool. So first of all, The shortest path problem, like you studied in Dijkstra's algorithm. Okay. So you have a source, you have a sink, I want to know what's the length of a shortest path from S to T. So how would you, if I gave you as a black box a subroutine that computes min cost flows, do you see how you would use that? You just use it once to as a black box give you a shortest path? So the costs are going to stay the same, right? So, but uh, in min cost, so how would this work? You have this graph, you want to compute the shortest path from S to T, okay? So what's clear is you're going to feed the black box exactly the same graph, exactly the same S, exactly the same T, exactly the same edge costs. So the only thing you have to do is sort of give every edge a capacity so that it type checks for the min cost flow algorithm, right? It's expecting an input with capacities. But just give whatever capacities you want. Give like every edge capacity one, for example. What's the min cost flow going to be? 
oh, so D, by the way, so the flow value you can just set to 1. The min cost flow is going to find the cheapest way to, so to send one unit of flow from S to T. There's no, there's no binding capacity constraint, so it's just going to pick a shortest path to do it. Okay? That's all. Just set capacities to 1, invoke min cost flow, you get back a shortest path. So max flow is also can be thought of as a special case. It's a little awkward the way I formulated it, but still you can think of it this way. So max flow, you know, your graph, you already have a graph, you, have a, you already have a source, you already have a sink, you already have capacities. Presumably you just pass those into the min cost flow black box. But you need to set the costs. So how should we set the costs so that a type checks for the min cost flow subroutine? The simplest thing to do is just set them to zero. Okay? And so now, what is the min cost flow subroutine going to do? It's going to tell you whether or not there's a feasible flow with value D. Right? That's what min cost flow does. How do you set D? Well, you kind of want to set D to be the max flow value, because right? that's what you're trying to compute, which sounds circular, but then you're like, oh, I, dude, binary search. No worries. Right? Set D to be 100, run min cost flow. If it says, there is a feasible flow with value 100, you double it to 200. If not, you have it to 50, and you search until you find the largest D so that there is a feasible flow. Okay? Yep? Are we not negative costs? Uh, we are. Yeah, that's fine. So just in the same way that with matching, we were allowed to, I kind of assume them away, but it's basically without loss, you know, negative costs don't really mess up matching either. Yeah. So, I mean, there is, so, right, yeah. So negative costs are fine. Okay, so that's how you get max flow. And then this I put on exercise set number three. But min cost perfect bipartite matching, the problem we just saw with the Hungarian algorithm is also a special case of min cost flow. And this is really exactly the same reduction that you saw reducing max cardinality bipartite matching to maximum flow. That same reduction lets you reduce the min cost bipartite matching to the min cost flow problem. Okay. But you should think about that, in, you should think through the details in, uh, in exercise set number three. Okay. Any questions about that? In, I mean, so it, in min cost flow, it's just part of the input. It doesn't. Yeah. So, I mean, a, an equivalent problem would be to say among all max flows, find more with minimum cost, a roughly equivalent problem. So you could do it that way too, right? So like in the min cost perfect matching, I said, what if there are many perfect matchings, which one do you pick? Pick the one with the cheapest cost. You can also phrase min cost flow that way too. Okay, so find a max flow, but if there's many max flows, find the one with the minimum cost. Sometimes it's convenient, sometimes you're not really trying to maximize the flow, you really just need to get a certain amount of stuff from point A to point B. Like, if you think about it, that's a pretty sort of basic problem. Um, you're just like putting stuff on trucks to ship from your factory to all these different places, and you want to do it as cheaply as possible. And then you kind of have a D. And then the, the thing which is maybe a little subtle, which is sort of glossed over, is you know, this question about how would you use this as a black box to solve any of these problems. The black box is expecting a D. So in any of these, you better set D to something. Shortest pass, you can just set it to 1. Max flow, you, know, you kind of want to do binary search on D. Min cost perfect matching, if you think about it, you want to set D to be equal to N. Uh, because you really want to sort of, in, if you go back to that reduction that we talked about for bipartite matching, you really want something which saturates all of the edges out of the source, and all of those were unit capacity edges, so here D is going to be equal to N. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, like, can you explain how to deal with the case when there's negative H? Because in perfect matching, we can just increase every edge, but in mean cost flow, we can't do that. That's correct. You have to handle it directly. So the algorithms have to actually... Um, uh, I mean, so you, so you don't do a reduction to the non-negative case. So a negative, so good. So what, one of the things I'm going to ask you to think about in problem set number two are the optimality conditions. And again, you've seen a number of examples. Different problems have different optimality conditions, but they're usually very natural. 
And actually, from in-cost flow, the optimality condition is that the residual graph, once you extend it to have costs, should not contain any negative cycle. So if you have a negative cycle in the residual graph, it gives you a way to replace the current flow with a cheaper flow. And then the hard direction, which you have to prove, is that if there's no negative cycle in the residual graph, actually you're guaranteed to be optimal. So you just deal with it. So it's a good question. You just deal with negative costs directly as part of the problem. And negative cycles, they're actually not a problem. Right? So for shortest paths, right? so if, if, if edges had infinite capacity, then a negative cycle would be a problem because you could get negative infinity cost just by pushing flow around the cycle over and over and over again. But if you have finite capacity on every edge, negative cycles aren't a problem. They're just an opportunity for improvement. There's an opportunity to have a better flow, which you're fine with. Okay. Good questions. Other questions? Yep. No, FE times CE. Times yeah. I don't know what's clearest. Yeah. Right, so problem set number two, I'll ask you to think about optimality conditions. So no negative cycles characterizes optimality. I'll also step you through the analog of Ford Fulkerson. So just what's a simple augmentation based algorithm guaranteed to terminate with no uh, negative cost cycle in the residual graph. Okay, so that'll just give you nothing, nothing too crazy, but just give you a feel for the basics of the problem. Yep. It should be, yeah. Nothing above D. Yeah, so I mean, if you think about it, right, so like, suppose, suppose, right, I mean, so one way to see why this isn't a big deal, suppose we had a flow network, no costs, just a flow network, and I just wanted to know, if there's a flow with value D, find me one, or tell me that there isn't one. There's a very simple way to solve that problem just via a very simple reduction to the normal max flow problem, which is you just take your source, you add an extra source, an S prime, you connect S prime to S with an edge of capacity D. Okay, so now when you run max flow in this new network, where you have, right, so suppose in this network, you either want to find a flow with value exactly D, or you should tell me that there isn't one. Then again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add S prime here. I'm going to add something with capacity D there. If there was a flow of value at least D, in the original graph G, this computation will give me a flow of value exactly D. If there was no flow with value D before, there's not going to be one now either, so I'll correctly deduce that fact. So the exact versus maximum thing isn't, isn't really a big deal. Yeah, it's a fair question though. Other questions? So that's actually all I was going to say about min cost flow. Okay? But again, you'll see some more about it on problem set number two. Oh yeah, the, one, the other one thing I was going to just say about this web, Right, so, I mean, just, just to help you understand how much of these are the natural sequel of what we've already talked about and how well you're equipped you are to do them. I mean, if we had a semester instead of a quarter, I would just teach you those in the next four lectures. But it's time to move on to linear programming next week, so I'm not going to do it. Okay? But it's really, they would fit very, very nicely in what we've been talking about. All right. So any other min cost flow questions? Those I want to talk a little bit about non bipartite matching. Questions? So non-bipartite matching. So the input undirected graph, arbitrary undirected graph, not necessarily bipartite. Of course, a matching, the idea of a matching makes perfect sense in a general graph, just a subset of edges with no shared endpoints. So you can certainly talk about finding the maximum size, the maximum cardinality matching in a general graph. So for example, what's the max weight, sorry, the max cardinality matching size in a five cycle?
Not a trick question. Is there a perfect matching? No, there's an odd number of nodes. Of course, there's not a perfect matching. So there's only five, there's five nodes, so you could match at most four of them with two edges, and of course, that's possible. Okay? To opt equals two. And in general, odd cycles are the simplest possible non bipartite graphs. Okay, so they already sort of illustrate um, the issues with a non bipartite case. And I should say, you know, a priori, it's really not easy to see whether or not this problem should be polynomial time solvable or NP hard. Really, a priori, there's no reason to expect this necessarily to be efficiently solvable. It is, but it's really not easy to see it. Okay? So it certainly appears harder than the bipartite case. For example, there's definitely no natural reduction uh, known from non-bipartite matching to the maximum flow problem, for example. So it really seems like a new problem, a, a possibly harder problem. So I want to talk a little bit about the optimality condition, which is uh, quite beautiful for matchings. So how do we know when we're done? So given a matching on a non-bipartite graph, how do we know whether it's maximum cardinality or not? So for example, how would you prove to me that some non-bipartite graph does not have a perfect matching? Remember, Hall's theorem tells us how to do that in the bipartite case. Hall's theorem says that a graph has a perfect matching if and only if, for every subset of left-hand side nodes, the number of neighbors it has on the right-hand side is at least as large as it absolutely has to be. Right, so if you have 10 nodes on the left, they better have at least 10 different neighbors on the right. If you ever fail that condition, it's a convincing proof that you can't have a perfect matching. Okay? But of course, this Hall's condition refers to a left-hand side and a right-hand side. So that doesn't even really make sense for a non-bipartite graph. So we need some other more general optimality condition. So think about the following graph. So I'm going to take five triangles. Right, so it's certainly not bipartite. And I'm going to connect them in a star, a pinwheel. So how big is uh, optimal matching here? How many, how, how many edges can you get? So there's 16 nodes, so a perfect matching would have size 8. Six. Yep, agreed. I heard it from a few people. Excellent. Opt equals six. And this really, you know, this claim is both an upper and a lower bound. To show you is at least six, I just have to show you the matching. So there's a lot of them, but like here's one. Uh, Right, so that's uh, six pink edges. Why can't there be more than six? Remember, this is the hard part. How do I convince you that there can't be a matching of size seven? Well, here's a way you could think about it. You can say, well, think about, think about a triangle. Right? So at most, two of the vertices of the triangle are matched to each other. Okay? So the only way to match all three vertices of a triangle is to match one of those three triangles outside the triangle. And here, in this graph, that could only mean to the center. Okay? So any triangle with all three vertices matched has to be matched to the center. Now, the center can only be matched to one vertex. So four out of the five triangles have to have some vertex unmatched. Okay? So you have 16 vertices, four have to go unmatched, that leaves you with 12. That gives you a matching size of six. Okay? So in general, this idea gives us a way to upper bound the size of a maximum matching. So lemma, in every graph, opt, the size of a maximum matching, is at most the following. Let me just write it down and then I'll walk you through it.
All right, so I owe you a definition. What is OC? Uh, it's not Orange County. OC stands for odd components. So what OC of S says is the following. It says, you give me a subset of vertices, I rip them out of the graph. Okay? In general, this shatters the remaining graph into multiple pieces, multiple connected components. I look at the parity of each of those connected components. They're either odd or even. And I just count up the number of those connected components that are odd. And that's OC of S. Number of odd components after ripping out S. So for example, in this picture, you want to think about just taking S to be the center alone. Okay? If I rip the center out of this graph, how many odd components do I have? Five, right? Each of the triangles becomes a, a component of size three. So if I choose S to be the center, what do I get on the right-hand side here? Well, I get 16. This is a five, and this is a one. Okay? So the five minus one here, the four, that's equivalent to where we said that four out of the five triangles have to have some unmatched node. And so again, if this is the total number of nodes, this many has to go unmatched, then this is the number that, uh, this is sort of an upper bound on how many can be matched, and then as far as number of edges, you divide by two. Okay? So the claim is this is true in general, no matter what the graph is. Um, so just a quick, sort of already talked through it, but... So what's the argument for all of the odd size components of V minus S? Well, if you're odd size, you can't have a perfect matching internally. Just like this triangle cannot be perfectly matched internally. So at least one vertex of this odd component is not matched internally. Okay. So that means there's at least OC of S such vertices. And if any of these are matched, they can only be matched to vertices of S. Okay. They can't be matched to each other. Right, so there's no way to match this vertex with that vertex because there's no edge. Why is there no edge? Because these were different connected components after I ripped out S. Okay? So what does it mean that you're a connected component after you rip out S? It means all of the edges that stick out of this go to S, not to anywhere else. Okay? So the only, the only eligible vertices to match these two are in S. So... At least the number of odd components minus S vertices go unmatched. And that gives us this bound. Okay? So again, if at least this many go unmatched, then at most this many vertices get matched, which means there's at most that many edges. Okay. So any questions about that? That's right. So then, uh, is that also supposed to be an upper bound of opt, or can that be, can, can we prove that it is equal to opt? Good, that's exactly where we're going. So we have proved that it's an upper bound. That's what the lemma says. So if there's anything unclear about the proof that it's an upper bound, you should ask. So this upper bound is an analog of when, you know, back in lecture one or two, we had just proven that the max flow value is at most the min cut value. That any cut is an obvious upper bound on how big, um, how big a flow could be. So for, let me call this star, this right hand side here. So what star is, star says, well, Suppose we're just going to prove upper bounds on the maximum matching size using this simple argument. 
okay, where we rip things out of the graph, we look at the number of odd components, and then that's how many, that minus the size of what we ripped out is how many must be unmatched. So star really says, what's the smallest possible upper bound, i.e. the best, the tightest upper bound, you can prove if all you do is think about these obvious obstructions, okay, like in the pinwheel. And now what's totally not obvious is whether or not there can be a gap between star and the size of a maximum matching. Whether or not, you know, there might be other reasons why the max matching is small other than just the obvious obstructions. So really one of my favorite results in combinatorics says that actually there's never a gap. So there always exists, in every single graph, there always exists a matching with size equal to star. So this is known as the Tut-Burge formula. And it says that equality holds in the lemma. Okay? So Tut and Burge are both sort of famous graph theorists from the mid-20th century. So Tut in the 40s gave a characterization of which graphs, not necessarily bipartite, uh, have a perfect matching. So he gave the non-bipartite generalization of Hall's theorem. And then in the 50s, Burge observed that you can use the same idea to prove this formula to characterize the max matching size, whatever it may be. Okay. All right, so there are some pretty just like slick proofs, one page proofs by induction uh, of the Tut Burge formula. But I'm an algorithms person, so I really like to have algorithmic proofs. And so that first came along in the mid 60s. A famous algorithm of Edmonds, known as the Blossom algorithm. So this is from 65. And the main sort of technical result in the paper is a polytime algorithm for max cardinality non-bipartite matching. So this was in 65. Okay? So the proofs of the Tut-Burge formula were not constructive. They didn't give efficient algorithms. Edmonds gave an efficient algorithm, and as a byproduct of his algorithm and analysis, he proves the Tut-Burge formula. So his algorithm actually concludes with a matching whose size equals the star there. Okay, so that shows that every graph is always a matching so that equality holds. So that's cool. That's an algorithmic proof of the Tut-Burge formula. This paper is also sort of famous for this sort of almost throwaway section, just, which is just called digression. The name of the uh, paper is Paths, Trees, and Flowers. So this is 65, and Edmonds, along with a couple other people independently, was really the first one to propose that polynomial running time is a good definition of computational efficiency. Now, mind you, NP-completeness hadn't even been defined yet. That was by Cook and Levin in 71. So this is before, really, complexity classes were being thought about. No one had defined P, no one had defined NP. But Edmonds observed that his algorithm had running time n to the fourth. And he said, I think this is a good algorithm. And let me propose as a definition of a good algorithm that the running time scales polynomially in the input size. And he noted that brute force search is not polynomial. And he conjectured that problems like the TSP actually do not have any polynomial time algorithm. So back in 65, even though he didn't have the language, he's conjecturing that P not equal to NP. Okay? So it's a very fun paper to read. I'll post a link to it on the course site. And uh, yeah. What else did I want to say? Oh, right. And actually, so again, last year when I taught 261, I actually taught this algorithm. Uh, it was the 50th anniversary, so it sort of seemed appropriate. Um, but it took up two full lectures, so I, I cut it this year to make room for some other topics. But again, just to like, prove the point, this is something I could teach you in 261. Okay? So, and you can study it uh, on your own if it interests you. Okay. So that's the story for mass cardinality matching, Tut-Burge formula. Again, you know, so Edmund's algorithm was sort of the same kind of m times n squared, but sort of state-of-the-art stuff gets more like n times m, even a little bit better, at least theoretically. Okay. All right, so now the hardest problem. So min cost, or equivalently max weights, non-bipartite matching, 
And so here again, like the main thing I just want you to know is that this is still a poly time solvable problem. And glibly, you might think, well, you know, maybe I'm not surprised because Edmonds Blossom algorithm tells us how to deal with the non bipartite aspect, and the Hungarian algorithm tells us how to deal with the costs. So let's just kind of like put them in a blender, and we should get something that handles costs and non bipartite. And while sort of from 30,000 feet is sort of true, like, really, like actually doing it is not easy. Okay, so this I didn't teach in 261. I taught this in a 300 level class many years ago. So this again is due to Edmonds a little bit later than his unweighted case. But again, it can be done. Okay. Um, actually, one thing I just wanted to say about the original Blossom algorithm. So what's the challenge? Right? So, so why, why is the non-bipartite case harder than bipartite? Okay. Well, actually, we saw this toward the beginning of this lecture. If you remember when you were arguing about that search tree that we were growing, in the bipartite case, and we argued either we get a good path or we can do a price update. And crucial to that argument was this point that it can't be the case that there's some matched edge, currently matched edge, so that we find both of its endpoints in the same level. Okay, so we can't get both the endpoints in level one, for example. Why not? That would exhibit a triangle. It's bipartite, there can't be a triangle. In a non-bipartite case, this can totally happen. Okay, so the way Edmonds algorithm works is you actually do exactly the same search tree interleaving the levels, but then you have this additional big complication, which is sometimes you pick up a matched edge that creates an odd cycle. And really no one knew how to fix that for a while, but then Edmonds idea was, he called it shrinking blossoms. So he called the odd cycle a blossom and he contracted it okay, into a super node and then recursed on the smaller graph and he called that shrinking a blossom. And then, basically, at the end of the algorithm, you have to undo the recursion and uncontract all of these things again. Okay? So again, it's sort of, you know, an extra big idea on top of what we already saw for the, for the flow algorithms. And then in the, max, in the min cost max weight non-bipartite algorithm, so what's challenging now is that if you're using the Blossom approach, you have these super nodes corresponding to contracted um, components, contracted odd cycles, and somehow maintaining the prices on the vertices gets very complicated once you start contracting nodes. Okay, so that's, those are the kind of issues that you have to figure out to actually make this work, but it can be done. Okay, so there is a polynomial time algorithm, even for non-bipartite and costs, and again, state-of-the-art gets you around maybe n times m or so. Okay. So I do want to be honest, you know, we're talking about all these, you know, often, you know, theorists equate polynomial time with efficiently solvable, but, you know, it's a little, you know, the, the picture is a little more complicated than that. It really depends on, you know, how big your instance size is and so on, right? So linear time is awesome, right? Like if it fits in main memory, you're probably fine, basically. You know, already with quadratic time, you start having some issues, right? So something, you know, something of size like 10 million probably fits in main memory, but that squared is not a running time you're really going to be able to handle, okay? These algorithms are almost more in sort of the cubic, cubic in the number of vertices. So for something like min costs non-bipartite matching, uh, up to maybe a thousand nodes, I guess you'd be fine. Certainly like high hundreds. But once you were in many thousands of vertices, uh, you'd actually have trouble uh, solving those problems using this kind of algorithm machinery. So, and this is the last point I'm going to make. So, also on problem set number two, you're going to study, well, you know, so what if you have a really big graph, right? What if you have a million vertices? And probably in your other computer science graphs, uh, classes, you've been given plenty of motivations for graphs with millions, if not billions of vertices. So then you really say, I need to run a linear time algorithm. And maybe I'm willing to give up on finding the exactly optimal matching. I just want like a quite good matching and I want it in near linear time. Okay, so that's again, that's very well motivated, it's very interesting, and there's theory about exactly that question, and again, you're learning the tools that help you understand this theory. So the baby step here would just be, again, consider this hardest problem, min cost non bipartite matching. Suppose we give up on optimality, we just want to be fast, okay? We're going to do a heuristic, all right? Well, of all the paradigms you learn in CS161, you know, one of the ones that almost, almost led to really fast algorithms were greedy algorithms. Okay, they're often not correct, but they're again a really good starting point for heuristics. And there's a very natural greedy algorithm for non-bipartite matching. 
right? Just like, it's really just like Kruskal's algorithm. Right, so you, again, suppose it's the max weight version of it. So we want big weights. Why not just sort the edges, again, not necessarily by part type, general graph. Sort the edges from highest weight to lowest weight. Do one pass through the edges in this order. And include in the edge, the current edge, in your matching if you can. Meaning if you haven't yet matched either one of its endpoints. Okay? So you'll definitely pick the first edge. The second edge you'll pick if it's disjoint from the first edge, but you'll skip it if it shares an endpoint with the first edge, and so on. Okay? So this is not always going to be optimal. That's quite easy to see. Actually, I don't even need that. So if I just have a zigzag, right, with a 1 plus epsilon, like 1.01 in the middle, and then 1 on either side, this greedy algorithm is going to pick the zigzag edge, right, because that's the highest weight one, and that will block the other two edges, okay? So the max weight matching here is total weight 2. The greedy algorithm I just mentioned will be off by, will only be half of that, okay? But it turns out that's, a, that's actually a worst example for the greedy algorithm. For every graph, no matter what the edge weights are, the greedy algorithm will always guarantee you at least 50% of the weight in the best matching. And of course, that's a worst case bound. It can be achieved, but in lots of graphs, you'll do better than 50%. But even in the worst case, you're already 50%. And the proof is not too hard. Okay, so uh, you'll, see that, you'll see that on the homework. And in the last module of 261, we'll talk about approximation algorithms for NP-hard problems, so things where an exact solution would require more than polynomial time. But it's worth remembering, you know, even the harder problems in P, and when you study non-bipartite matching, you can really feel you're in, like, you know, the barren tundra, the outer reaches of P. You can tell that NP-hardness is, like, just around the corner. So even for those harder problems in P, it's worth thinking about fast heuristics. And again, the theory that you're learning in this class helps you understand when they work well. Okay. So Tuesday, we'll start talking about linear programming. See you then.